This week on the Back Table Podcast, sitting down, hearing this guy tell me his experience in this format, I was like, God, I would just love to share that conversation. He's on my list of people I want to get on the show, obviously. But that to me was like, how lucky am I that I get to hear from these people that I get to experience this conversation that feels really important and personal. But man, everybody would love to hear it because I would love to hear those conversations that I'm not a part of too. And so to me, that's really where this whole show comes from is like that opportunity to sit with someone who just seems so far away from where you are, that person we put on a pedestal in our minds that oftentimes is dealing with some of the same stuff we are. So that's really been like the the nugget where it all this kind of this all grew out of for me, where I really wanted to have conversations like that every week. Hey everybody, welcome to the Back Table OBGYN podcast. This is Aaron Fritz as your initial host slash co-host for this new show. Very excited. Uh, for those of you in the OBGYN audience who don't know me, I'm an interventional radiologist and we started Back Table as a IR show about five years ago. And since then, we've created new specialty shows. We've got the IR show, we've got an ENT show, a urology show a med tech innovation show, and now excited to launch this OBGYN show as we found the podcast medium to be a great format for dispersing information and putting out peer-to-peer high-quality content so that you get this practical advice for your day-to-day from your peers, people you probably know and have run into at conferences. We like to call it the meeting after the meeting because these are the conversations that we have you know, at the hotel bar or at the restaurant where we're picking each other's brains about, you know, hey, how did you add this to your service line? Or how did you get that referral base in? Or, you know, how did you learn this new device or new technique? That's the kind of stuff that we like to talk about on this show. So for this first episode, I want to turn the tables a bit and let the audience know a little bit more about kind of the ringleader, the quarterback of the GYN host or show, Mark Hoffman. Mark, thanks for you know, I'll I'll, t- I'll tell the story a little bit about how we met and how this all started, but uh, I want to welcome you to the inaugural OBGYN show. Well, thanks, Aaron. This is uh, this is super exciting for me. Um, yeah, I'll let you talk about kind of how this all got started, but this is something I've wanted to do for a long time. I think the same thing you love about meetings is going in, not necessarily networking for like career advancement, but just talking to people, understanding how they do what they do, you know, learning from other people who've done similar things other places. And as a minimally invasive GYN surgeon, you know, there's not a ton of us, at least there certainly weren't a ton of us when I first came out like 10 years ago uh, and started my practice. So like these were the places where like I would have to find out like how do I how do I start a practice? How do I start a fiber program? How do I start an endometriosis program? How do I set up my clinic templates? Very basic stuff that on an island where I was, it was really isolating and those restaurant, bar, coffee shop conversations are what 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 allowed me to succeed, what allowed me to have that reassurance that I was doing the right thing or some good tips that, hey, this is, you should stop doing what you're doing and do it this way because we did that already. Um, and so, allowing me to have those conversations, but these are conversations that I think others want to hear. I certainly would, would want to hear those conversations and and uh, save everyone else the trouble of, of uh, having to go through everything the first time. And it's just a uh, it's a great platform, a great medium to do that. And uh, I'm, I'm really, really, really excited to, to be a part of this. Yeah. So it's one of those things that it's a conference. We get to go to one, maybe two a year where we get to have those conversations and hunt those people down. I was just at a conference, uh, the big IR conference in Europe called Circe. And it's so hard. Everybody's pulled in all different directions. It's so hard to like tackle people down and get, you know, hey, let's meet for coffee. Let's meet for a beer. Let's meet for dinner. Because everybody has all these obligations, whether it be with industry or what, or, you know, somebody already got to them. And so we, you know, I think podcasting is great for, this is, I was going to dive into this later, but might as well talk about it now. I think podcasting is great for putting this information out year round, right? So you don't have to wait till that conference. You can hear it straight from Mark Hoffman's voice instead of having to, you know, hunt him down about his minimally invasive practice, you know, at the at the next conference in December. So I really enjoy I it kind of came out of left field, but I really enjoy podcasting. And um, you know, we're lucky to have such a great team of docs, engineers, staff, and and just to give the audience a little feedback or background, 
So, you know, on the IR show, we had Mark on with Merv Ozen from University of Kentucky uh, on the show to talk about fiber embolization and, and sort of, you know, the collaboration with the, the GYN folks at, at University of Kentucky. And afterwards, um, it was with Ali Behetti, right? And afterwards, Ali texted me directly afterwards. Ali texted me, hey, you got to talk to this uh, Mark Hoffman guy. He's really interested in what we're doing at Backtable. And then that, and then you and I connected probably like the week after, and then and here we are, you know. I mean, yeah, well, I was talking to Ness, the engineer. Yes. Afterwards, and I was just, I mean, I was super excited to do the show. I think I, I'm pretty social media naive, but there was a somebody had posted something about a, you know, GYN relationships with IR, and I was like, oh, we did it, super easy. Um, here's how we did it. And I'm like, oh, you should be on Backtable, and I need to go find that tweet because I don't think it was anybody associated with. You. With the show, it was just someone who was, I think, a listener, and I was like, "What is what is back table?" And then you or somebody responded, "Hey, we'd love to have you on." And so I was like, "Oh wow, I get to be on a podcast. This is so cool." Because <laughs> it's back, you know, there was there is no back table OBGYN until right now, and so there was no, it wasn't part of our community. And in talking to a couple of IR docs, like, "Oh yeah, I get to be on back table." They're like, "You're going to be on back table?" Like they had heard, they had heard of it. They're like, thought I was kidding because they're like, "No way." And so. Getting to do the show, I was super excited. I mean, I I, I talked to you about this before. I had, I had bought mics and equipment before. This is something I thought about doing at meetings or, you know, grand rounds and things, but understanding how challenging the back end stuff is, the engineering and making it a good show, making it sound professional was more than I ha had time to do. And as a guest on your show and having Ness there, I was like, oh, okay, this is how a show is done. This is amazing. And just chatting with Ness about it, he's like, you should, you should probably talk to Aaron because I think they're looking for other shows. And I was like, you want me just to email the owner of the podcast company? He's like, yes, you, you should do that. And you guys should chat. And then you and I talked for like an hour. It was just like, just made sense. It was just like awesome. And I was, I was like telling my wife, I was like, oh, I don't know how, I don't know, man, I, that was too good to be true. There's no way this is going to work out. And I was like super nervous about it. I was, it's, she knows she's like, this is your thing. You should do this. And I was like, I hope they agree. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it only makes sense, right? And we'll talk about your practice here in a minute, but like there's so much overlap with OBJN and urology and IR, right? Not so much ENT, but a little bit. Gopi, my wife says there's a little bit. But mucosal you know, surfaces. <laughs> right. There you go. Yeah. And certain disease processes probably. And it just made sense because we were like going in all these other directions. What's our next show going to be? You know, whatever. And we, I think we were just way off base and, 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 and you came along and, and the interest. And this is something we've talked on the, on the show, the, the IR show before is what it takes to start a new show. That's kind of one of the common questions I get from other podcasters. And it's all about the time commitment, right? I mean, it's, it's not easy. I think people try it. I just heard a, a statistic at the last podcast movement conference that there's something like 4 million podcasts out there, but a very small percentage of those have actually put out more than 10 episodes and a, a, an even smaller percentage have even put out an episode in the last month. No. And, and again, like that's two things. One is I looked, I was researching how to put the shows together and that's why I didn't do it because I saw it looked like a mammoth undertaking, but also credit to you for like being able to succeed and continue doing it for five years and having multiple shows. And like, it's unreal what you've done. Honestly, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it, it, it is, I don't have to tell you how much work it is, but it seems like an immense, immense lift. It's a labor of love and, and it's, but it's a cool community and the podcast community is cool, is amazing. And then once the, the podcast catches on within your specialty, then it creates its own unique community, which is also very uh, awesome to, to, to see and be a part of. Well, let's talk a little bit about your practice just for our audience so that they kind of know where you're coming from. Your, your practice is mostly minimally invasive and laparoscopic procedures. Can you tell us like what your average week looks like? What's your case mix? Yeah. So um, it's one of the newer subspecialties in OBGYN. It's not boarded like you would, you know, for GYN oncology or MFM, but it is uh, it has been recognized by ABOG, which is the American Board of OBGYN, as a like a focus practice designation. So there is some now, whatever it means, we're not sure, but there is some national recognition for those of us who do primarily gynecologic surgery, minimally invasive GYN. You know, generally speaking, OBGYN residencies are four years long, 
15 months of them are spent on a GYN service. So hmm. five, six years for general surgery residents plus 85% of them go on to fellowship. Yeah. Um, and we're looking at our residents are graduating with 15 months of surgical training. And, and so I think most of us in this world see that challenge. Um, and fellowships yeah. are one of the ways that we've that we've tried to increase our surgical experience and our practices in those things. So that's an evolving thing that we'll definitely try to touch on on this show. But um, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of generalists out there, general OBGYNs who are phenomenal surgeons, right? It's it's, But it's not always super straightforward and, and s- streamlined in how you build a GYN practice these days. Um, and so I came back to University of Kentucky after finishing fellowship at the University of Michigan 10 years ago, just over 10 years ago. And I have a great chair who's been very supportive, but bringing a new specialty into a place where it wasn't before has a ton of challenges and has a ton of not just clinical challenges, which, you know, not having someone behind you to go, oh, don't worry, I got this. Like, you're just, you're it. So hopefully you've figured it out. Or, you know, just the, you know, like I I said earlier, setting up clinic templates or, you know, how to spend your time. So, you know, these days my time is spent, you know, I'm in an academic practice, so I have some time for teaching and those kinds of things. But I'm basically in clinic a couple days a week, OR a couple days a week. Um, we also started a GYM program at the VA, which is uh, in town. Mm. Huge opportunity for us to contribute to that population. The largest growing population of the VA network is females, right? Because there weren't a ton of female veterans, you know, right. in the last couple of world wars. But these days, it's a huge part of the of the VA population is as as they become veterans and age, they haven't always had access, and so we're building that at the VA too. So. Most of, I do that two days a month. So um, it's GYN only, primarily complex, benign GYN disease and surgeries. And luckily I get to be around students and residents uh, as part of my day-to-day as well. Why did you choose academics over private practice? Did you consider both? Because there were no private practice jobs (laughs) uh, for minimally invasive GYN surgeons 10 years ago. I mean, to be totally honest, you know, most... The life of an OBGYN when I was in training, kind of what they talked to us about was you start out like 80, 90% OB and your patients age with you. You do their, mm. you know, annuals yeah. and paps when they're, you know, younger and then they get pregnant and have kids and you do their deliveries and then they start having GYN problems and you do their surgeries and take out their uterus and then you take care of them with a menopausal and then you retire. Right? Yeah. Like you, you get older and so your practice would shift from primarily obstetrics early on to primarily GYN when you retire. But I think a lot of the challenges with that were that you're not doing a ton of surgical volume and training and you get out and then you don't operate much because you're doing primarily obstetrics. Uh, obstetrics. It's hard to keep those skills up as we've gone from primarily abdominal surgery from the people who train me now to laparoscopic, robot-assisted laparoscopy, vaginal surgery, which you know, in my group, mostly the urogynes do, and hysteroscopic surgeries, which before, you know, you wouldn't have that option. We have advanced hysteroscopic stuff we do. So there's all these different approaches that it's not just, you know, I joke, the OBGYN boards were a lot easier 30 years ago because the answer was always hysterectomy. You just yeah. always pick that one and you're, you're going to pass. We have a ton of different ways we approach these benign um, disorders in gynecology and it's it, it can be it can be complicated. And so being able to bring that to a new institution had its own series of challenges, but you know, I got a new partner who started, and um, you know, we've it, nationally now minimally invasive GYN surgery. There are more jobs open than there are minimally invasive GYN surgery fellows graduating, which I laugh because I mean, I lit- literally had to call multiple chairs that I knew and said, "Hey, remember me? Here's what I do. Do you guys need it?" And they're like, "Hmm, I'll call you back." It's like they didn't even know what yeah. it was. Yeah, and now as someone who's tried to hire somebody. I'm like, hey, come to Kentucky. And like, sorry, I got, a, you know, a job in my hometown or something. Like it's right right now. I wish there was all these fellows looking for jobs. <laughs> I'm the person looking for someone yeah, like to hire looking, and there's too yeah. many jobs available. Yeah. So that's, that's what got me into academics. I, I don't know that I would be having as much fun in private practice, but I don't know because I've not done it. But I, yeah. I've enjoyed a lot of the aspects of what I do in academics. It seems like a great culture at University of Kentucky. You know, we've had Driss Ricey. Yeah, we've had him and on. He's great. And, and Reve, uh, who's awesome, both on the show and the IR show. And, you know, and then we had, and then you came on and we're like, man, there's something about University of Kentucky. They seem to have a good crew over there. And um, so what what's the best, I mean, you mentioned, you know, working with the trainees and, and the, the case mix, but 
Anything else that's like kind of special about working at University of Kentucky? I mean, the population here is an underserved population. I think six of the bottom 10 counties in the country in terms of life expectancy for women are in the state of Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky. Wow. Having grown up in Kentucky, I grew up in Lexington, which is a, you know, medium to small size city, but it's an, you know, got a college, it's got into some industry. It's, you know, this, I grew up in a city, right? Pretty standard yeah. Midwestern city and went to college in Ann Arbor, lived in New York City, residency was in Chicago after doing med school here. So I'd never really been outside of Lexington in Kentucky besides just like leaving. And uh, I mean, having, I did AmeriCorps for a year after college and saw urban poverty in New York City and I did residency in the south side of Chicago. But coming back here, one of the things that when you're a, a, a MIG surgeon with no practice and no volume, they sort of say, hey, we, have, we need help here. And so I would use the opportunities to go take call and Hazard, Kentucky, which is in Perry County, which is the lowest life expectancy for women in the country. A lot of that is opioid-related, wow. opioid abuse. But some of these smaller hospitals, and you, you, know, you think about the issues with healthcare access um, in this country, what I saw and what I witnessed and experienced in, in Eastern Kentucky was something I had, didn't know existed in the continental United States. I mean, it was yeah. just, they, you know, you talk, talk to folks like, hey, where are you from? Like, I can't really like describe north, south, east, and west. I can just like drive you there. I mean, they live in hollers. And they, when they say holler, they mean an actual like description of like the side of the hill they live on. Wow. Um, and their whole family lives there and they've never really left. And, you know, it's a, just a couple hours from Lexington. It's not like you have to get on a plane or anything. It's a two-hour yeah. drive. I would do it in the morning, do clinic or surgery, and then drive back that, that evening. And I'd see a patient who had a, a problem that maybe I couldn't fix and say, why don't you come up to Kentucky to, to UK? And they would look at me like, I was asking them to hop on a rocket ship to the moon. I mean, it was like, right. it was impossible. Like, well, you can't do that yeah. here. I'm like, no, 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 we can't do that complicated thing you need. So like, all right, we'll just live with it. Like, I can't, I can't ask my partner to take off work. We have one car, gets terrible gas mileage, have them drive two hours for a initial right. meet and greet, new patient, come back for imaging, come back a third time for pre-op, then for surgery. And I'm looking at five days, six days off work plus travel. And it was just like, it was like asking them to, like I said, like build a rocket ship and fly off the planet. It was just impossible for them. And you go, okay, so I need to understand better the challenges that our, our patients in Kentucky are dealing with. And that's part of where the fibroid program came from, actually, was, uh, was yeah, my experience down there. Yeah. Like, can we get as much as possible done? And so we sat down, like it was the IR folks and me, we were just like, let's write this down on a piece of paper, let's describe you know, all the things that need to happen and can we get them to show up, get an MRI in the morning, see me in the afternoon, have it read by the MR folks before they see me, have IR come to our clinic, see patients, and they can leave in one day with all that done. But that was with those folks in mind. That was with those patients where access is a real challenge in a way that never occurred to me that that was something that was that big of a problem. But in, in this community, in these communities in Eastern Kentucky, it is, it is a real, real, real problem. Yeah. Yeah, so it sounds like Kentucky is your home. I mean, that's where you grew up. That's where you've, other than the stint in Michigan, that's where you've kind of always been. Ever had any dreams of uh, living anywhere else? I'm sure it'd be a easier to be a Michigan fan than a Kentucky fan going to football games. But any yeah, well, ever... luckily Ann Arbor is only five hours away, so we oh, get okay. to. Everyone thinks Kentucky is like south of Louisiana, and you're like, why? You know, I went to college up there, and like, why would you come all the way up here? Yeah. I'm like, man, you're from New York. Like, you have any idea how much closer it is for me? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, Lexington is a southern city, so people think of us as being yeah. super far south, but we're That's an hour wild. from Cincinnati. We're right. six hours from Chicago, from Detroit, from Cleveland. It's five hours away. So, like, we are, I think, culturally southern, but geographically, we're pretty Midwestern. Like, St. Louis and D.C. are equally north-south right. as, as we are. So, I drive east and west to get there, not north or south. And so, it's close to a bunch of stuff in... Did I consider living anywhere else? <laughs> One place I never considered living was Lexington, Kentucky. I never <laughs> thought about coming home in a million yeah. years. And my wife, who's not from Kentucky, also never once thought about living here. Uh, but then you have three kids and go, you know, like, I want to be able to be around my family. I don't want right. to spend, you know, commuting from University of Chicago back to my house on a, on a Cubs game day. Right. It was an hour and a half. Lakeshore Drive is a beautiful commute, but it's not as nice as, you know, being around my family. Totally. So. To be able to, I live two miles from my my office. Like I can go home for lunch if you know my last patient didn't show up or something. And I can I eat dinner with my kids almost every day. I drive my daughter to school twice a week. 
you don't get this time back, right? So finding a place where I have a job that I really like, having a, a place where I can do something I care about, like building a practice. That's what I wanted to do. I, yeah. I was offered a job at Michigan to stick around and great people there, but I wanted the challenge. And some days I wondered what I was thinking, but the challenge of building a practice, building a program and and and, and being around my parents, they're here, you know, like having grandparents around. I didn't get the chance to live in the same city as my grandparents. So all, all the personal stuff is why we came back and it's been nice to have the job I have for sure. But a lot of it was just like, how do I build a life that allows me to do my job well and also like be as good a family member as I can be. When you drive up to Michigan, do you drive around Ohio so you don't have to deal with any right, Ohio? Right, no longer. Right, we just <laughs> we, do, we don't we don't get gas. Right, that's the big thing. Right, we just yeah. don't stop. We just, yeah. Whatever you do, don't that's get out right. of the car. Well, my father in law went to Ohio State, so that's a, they're from Akron. So like oh, his, sorry, his okay. brother played for Woody Hayes. Ah, my uh, my in laws are all Buckeye fans, and my my so wife grew balance, up in Michigan, yeah. so she always grew up a Michigan fan. So that was that's been a challenge for them. Their, their well, whole life. Mark, get ready for me texting you d during that Ohio State uh, Michigan game. For the, listen, I get, yeah, I, all the, the last 15 years have been pretty ugly with you. <laughs> so last year yeah. felt pretty darn good. Oh, I bet. It was a long time coming. I, you know, I was so happy terrible. for you guys. After about two weeks. That's of how bad it was, is that you yeah. were happy for <laughs> us. Like that should never happen. You should never, ever, like, oh, at least they're, you know, we, they beat yeah. us once. It feels good. Yeah, at least we're back to the rivalry. <laughs> <laughs> we look we look good right now i'm enjoying i'm enjoying oh, yeah, it we yeah. get, you know we get to yeah. go to a game every year you know we, we meet yeah. three of my buddies and we have uh, all of our families and we go up there for games every year it's a big deal for us we're going to the michigan state game this year they didn't look yeah. really good yesterday so no well um we won't bore our audience with football talk anymore but um actually it's okay we, we, we could go all day get used to it yeah <laughs> so the next question i want to ask you was i want to talk a little bit more about podcasts and you know we just kind of talked about how there's so many podcasts out there. But when we researched it, when you know, we talked about like maybe starting to join one, we always kind of look at okay, what's out there? What's is there anything that we're just, you know, competing with or anything resource, you know, if there's already a good resource, then why start a new one? And I don't, you know, despite the fact that there's a zillion crime podcasts and, you know, business podcasts, I don't feel like there's enough like actual medical education podcasts out there. And so I wanted to ask you about what do you, th how do you feel about OBGYN in terms of podcasts and even just resources? There are some great shows for sure. Um, I think, you know, there are more like med ed shows um, that are good. There's some that are affiliated with journals and industry. And we talked about that and they're, and they're good shows. And a lot of them, you know, my friends are doing, but they have a, a pretty specific agenda. And I think that what I haven't heard, what what I what is not out there is is what we're trying to do here, which is which is telling those stories of the of, of some of the people that I want to hear from at every meeting, and, and and being able to being able to bring those stories in a way that is very conversational and very very sort of free and open in, in that sense. And so there's some there are definitely good shows and a lot of people doing really really interesting things out there. But there there's definitely in my mind not the show that I wanted to hear, right? Which is I think where a lot of these things come from is. If I'm not listening to it, if I'm not curious about it, then then that's the show I want to make that that I would want to hear. Yeah, and it goes back to the practice building think piece that you were just talking about when you first started. And I think our sweet spot is probably that early career, you know, five to ten years out, uh, or zero to ten years out, rather, where we, we have this energy, we have this drive to build something when we come out of our training, and um, that I think is. Uh, hot topic and one that, you know, we talk about a lot on on the IR podcast. And I hope you guys will talk about that a lot on OBGYN. I imagine you will, given your experience and your the, the fact that you built a program. That was like twofold, right? I agree with you 100%. Like, I wished I'd had this show to help me build, but I also know, not that I think people want to hear my story per se, but like all the people that I talked to over the last decade plus who told me all the things I needed to hear, uh, good and bad, about what I was doing. And I think, I always go back to this one story, but, um, you know, John Stegge uh, started the Mix Fellowship at UNC, and he was walking back from an award ceremony at our meeting where he was given an award that was named after him. He was the inaugural award winner, mentorship award, John Stegge mentorship award. I think he was carrying the award in his hand, and I was, like, sitting at a coffee shop, and I know him, like, you know, I think I interviewed there. We've 
never trained with him. He's not a person I socially am close with, but he just said, hey, and I was like, oh, how's it going? Congratulations. And he goes, oh, how's, how's your practice? How's it work? And I was like, oh, it's good. He's like, oh, no, just, like what's, what's going on? And I was like, oh, you actually like, what you like, you want to hear, like, you're not just being nice. You're not just like, mm-hmm. hey, how are you? And like, I don't really want to know the answer. Like he was like, no, seriously, like how's, how's, how are things going? And we sat down for like 45 minutes and I was like, boom, 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 boom. Here's challenge A, B, C. And the way, he, I mean, this is a guy holding an award with his name on it and was like, oh, I'm dealing with these challenges too. And some of them I have figured out and some of them I'm still dealing with. And not only did it allow me to just practically solve some of the problems that I was dealing with, but it gave me a lot of grace for myself to just go, okay, if this guy is still dealing with some of the things that I'm dealing with, maybe I should give myself a break. Maybe I should just like take a deep breath, just go back to work, just chip away, you know, be a tugboat, just nudge, you know, things over time. It's it's not going to be perfect. And if this guy who I have the utmost respect for, I think a lot of people have the utmost respect for and look up to as being this like, man, this unachievable, unattainable goal. If he's sitting here telling me, oh, I did, I went through a bunch of that. I struggled here. I, I still, you know, have some challenges. Hearing that was career altering for me in a way that I don't think you can get out of a plenary session the same way. I don't think you can get out of a white paper or or, or, a, or an op-ed or something in a journal. I think sitting down, hearing this guy tell me his experience in this format, I was like, God, I would just love to share that conversation. He's on my list of people I want to get on the show, obviously. And I'm sure he has no recollection of our conversation. I'm sure he will not remember talking to me at all because he probably does this for a million people every day. But that to me was like, how lucky am I that I get to hear from these people that I get to experience this conversation that feels really important and personal, but man, everybody would love to hear because I would love to hear those conversations that I'm not a part of too. And so to me, that's really where this whole show comes from is like that opportunity to sit with someone who just seems so far away from where you are, that person we put on a pedestal in our minds that oftentimes is dealing with some of the same stuff we are. So that that that's really been like the the nugget where it all this kind of this all grew out of for me, where I really wanted to have conversations like that just every week. Mark, before we uh, wrap up here, I want you to give our audience a little bit of a teaser or trailer on what they can expect in the first six episodes. Yeah. So I'm a gynecologist. I don't do OB anymore. And so as we're trying to build the show and fill it out, we're going to have more OB um, down the road, but we're going to start with important topics, not just uh, OB joint specifically, but um, It'll be more gynecology based just from folks I know that we brought on the show, but also trying to bring in a lot of important women's health things. And that's one of the things when we first talked, I was like, look, OBGYN's a little different than some specialties, right? We're going to have to talk about maybe some more sensitive topics. And your response was, it's, you know, hey, it's your show. Like, bring, talk about what you think is important. And so yeah. we've got a guest coming and talking about the Roe v. Wade decision. She's a MDJD who is just like, again, one of these people I just feel like I should give her like a whole series of episodes just to talk about all the things that she can do. Yeah. Um, we've got folks talking about ergonomics and, you know, as, I, as we all struggle with as proceduralists, as surgeons with back shoulder pain and how we, how we deal with that and talk about, talk about surgeon ergonomics. We're going to talk about um, just waste and healthcare in general and what an impact as we watch uh, the world catch on fire, what our, what our role as healthcare providers is in that process. And so I think uh, uh, we've got some pretty, Pretty exciting shows coming up. I'm excited to get them, get them started. Um, as we grow, it's going to develop more and more and more. Yeah, I'm excited about the more collaborative ones, like the cross specialty ones, like the postpartum hemorrhage episode. Yeah, right. We've we've gotten be, we've gotten to be able, in addition to the fiber show, yeah, um, which was super yeah. fun. We've got Amy Park, who's going to be one of our hosts early on, a Eurogyn up at Cleveland Clinic, who's was a guest on the urology show, and uh, and so we. One of the things that I was thinking about earlier when you're talking about what we want for the show is, I mean, it's women's health, right? It's not just a procedural show, right, for, for OBGYN. So there's yeah. going to be women's health issues in every single show, right? Whether it's totally. urology, ENT, IR. I mean, there is so much to talk about for sure. women's health and, and the needs and, you know, and, and, the, and the lack of funding for all the things that we do. And so there's, there's a lot of stuff that we can get into that I'm excited about talking about. Perfect. Well, Mark, thank you so much for sharing uh, all the information about yourself. I'm sure the audience is going to learn much more about you as the as the show progresses and uh, get into some detailed and intimate conversations with your guests. I mean, 
that's the fun thing about the podcast is a lot of storytelling. It's a lot of anecdotes and people will be uh, learning um, a lot more about your guests and about you than they would at a, a lecture at a conference, which is, again, what I like about podcasting. No, and thank you again for the opportunity to do this. I think it's, again, incredible what you've done. And it's our, our goal is to you know keep that back table brand to give it the same level of professionalism and, and recognition around our community as well as you've done for yours. So we're excited, man. We really are. I mean, this is going to be a lot of fun and uh, I can't wait, to, can't wait to get started. Sounds good. Well, press uh, play on episode two, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.